Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Sempel, I'm an ordained reverend in Christ Life Church. I'm a pastor of Christ Life Church, a chaplain of Christ Life Church, a priest of Christ Life Church. I have a doctor in divinity, doctor in humanitarianism, doctor in ministry, doctor in metaphysics, all honor of course, honor professor of theology. Today, September 18th, concerns the justice for a day six rally, orchestrated by Trump supporters, Proud Boys, and others in support of defense of insurrectionists who were legally jailed for their involvement in an insurrection slash illegal attempt at overthrowing the lawful election on January 6th, in which nooses were hung by those for Trump's political enemies, which again, the depths of depravity, that is, idolatry. People were hung that day and people also died, all for the sake of one man that they equated to Jesus and God in their hearts and minds. There was anger, certainly, and there is still stoked anger in regard to the creation of these rallies. Here's an excerpt from a news article. Ex-FBI official says law enforcement needs to take upcoming right-wing rally in D.C. very seriously. Former FBI Deputy Director Andrew McCabe said Monday evening that law enforcement needs to take the upcoming right-wing rally in support of the DL January 6 riders very seriously as concerns mount about more potential violence on Capitol Hill. I think they should take it very seriously. In fact, they should take it more seriously than they took the same sort of intelligence that they likely saw on January 5th. McCabe on CNN contributed to CNN's Poppy Hollow on Aaron Burnett out front. Law enforcement members in Washington are sealing themselves against such possible unrest at the Justice for J6 rally planned on September 18th, which aims to support the insurrections charged in the riot. Link is in the description, by the way. Concerning the events on January 6th and other rallies by Trump supporters, QAnon, and Christian nationalists, if not domestic terrorists, which is the appropriate term for them, there are patterns in their behavior and thus possible security concerns about today. Given patterns of QAnon and Trump supporters alike, they are idolaters, both of which aren't Christians officially or otherwise, given their idolatry and absolute failure majesty in God's image, I, as a legally ordained reverend, have to affirm that they aren't Christians officially or otherwise, and that God is not with them and will never be, and their designs will not come to fruition. They are of hatred, racism, xenophobia, and certainly given their patterns are angry, so wrathful, children of wrath, and beings of hatred. Knowing this fact is the first step in understanding, and with understanding does come following Jesus' teaching to be of peace and love unconditionally and be forgiving. So today we will talk about anger, what the biblical definition is of it, as well as the theology concerning peaceably combating the unconstrained human nature and those of whom Lucifer is using to do unspeakable evils, regardless of if they are conscious of it or not. So, what is the biblical definition of anger? According to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology, anger is defined as strong emotional reaction of displeasure, often leading to plans of revenge or punishment. There are many words for anger in Hebrew and Greek, orge and thumos, thumos, are used more or less interchangeably. Link is in the description, by the way. According to the King James Dictionary, anger is defined as a violent passion of the mind excited by a real or supposed injury, usually accompanied with a propensity to take revenge or to obtain satisfaction from the offending party. This passion, however, varies in degrees of violence, and in ingenious minds may be attended only with a desire to reprove or chide the offender. Anger is also excited by an injury offered to a relation, friend, or party to which one is attached, and some degrees of it may be excited by cruelty, injustice, or oppression offered to those with whom one has not immediate connection, or even to the community of which one is a member. Nor is it unusual to see something of this passion roused by gross absurdities in others, especially in controversy or discussion. Anger may be inflamed till it rises to rage and temporary delirium, to excite anger, to provoke, to rouse resentment. Link is in the description, by the way. According to the ATS Bible Dictionary, anger is defined as a violent emotional, a painful nature, sometimes arising spontaneously upon just occasion, but usually characterized in the Bible as a great sin. Matthew chapter 5, verse 22, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, Colossians chapter 3, verse 8. Even when just, our anger should not be should be mitigated by a due consideration of the circumstances of the offense and the state of mind of the offender, of the folly and ill results 
of this passion, of the claims of the gospel, and of our own need of forgiveness from others, but especially from God. Matthew chapter 6, 15. Anger is in the scripture, frequently attributed to God. Matthew 7, 11, 28, 20. But not that he is liable to those violent emotions with the, the passion produces, but figuratively speaking, that is, after the manner of men, and because he punishes the wicked with severity of a superior provoked to anger. Link is in the description, by the way. These are very clear definitions concerning anger. So going off anger and knowing QAnon, Trump supporters, Proud Boys, are wrathful. What is human wrath's definition? According to the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, human wrath is defined as wrath when used of men is the exhibition of an enraged sinful nature and therefore always inexcusable. Which it always is inexcusable, by the way. Genesis chapter 4, 5, 6. Genesis 4, 9, 7. Proverbs 19, 19. Job 5, 2. Luke 2, 4, 28. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Galatians 5, 20. Ephesians 4, 31. Colossians 3, 8. It is for this reason that man is forbidden to allow anger to display itself in his life. He is not to give place unto wrath, Romans 12, 19, Martin, nor must he allow the sun go down upon his wrath, Ephesians 4, 26. He must not be angry with his brother, Matthew 5, 22, but seek agreement with them, lest the judgment that will necessarily fall upon the wrath will be meted out to him, Matthew 5, 25, 26. Particularly, is the manifestation of an angry spirit prohibited in the training and bringing up of the family, Ephesians 6, 4, Colossians 3, 19. Anger at all times is prohibited. Numbers 18, 5, Psalm 37, 8, Romans 12, 19, Galatians 5, 19, Ephesians 4, 26, James 1, verse 19, and verse 20. Link is in the description, by the way. So what does the Bible say about anger? Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rapid wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And that's James chapter 1, verses 19 through 21 in the Standard Version. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. And that's Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 9. You understand that version? Now this I say and testify in the Lord that he must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greed, to practice every kind of impurity, but that is not the way you learn Christ, assuming you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created in the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away all falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down your anger, and give no opportunity to the devil. Which, of course, all these people who are children of wrath end up doing, knowingly or not. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, not only just not only such as a good for building up, as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. And that's Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 32 in the Standard Version. Sorry for any screw ups there, by the way. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A hot tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. And that's Proverbs chapter 15, verses 1 and 18. 
in the Sound Version. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. And that's from Psalm chapter 37, verses 8 through 9 in the Sinai Version. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you don't gratify the desires of the flesh, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger. Pointed there, by the way. Rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So I like the idolaters, for example, and the children of wrath, things of hatred, will also not inherit the kingdom of God. Subsequently. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And that's from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25, in the Standard Version. The Bible is very clear on anger, and that it is sinful, because it leads to malicious and malevolent actions, especially physical harm to others, if not murders. And that's not commit murder, of course. So, what is the theological definition of anger? Here is an excerpt from the theological definition of anger according to Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Biblical Theology. The anger of God, unlike pagan gods, whose tyrants reflect the fickleness of their human creators, Yahweh expresses his wrath every day because he is a righteous judge. Psalms 711. At the same time, God is merciful and not easily provoked to anger. Exodus 34, 6, Psalm 1, uh, chapter 103, verses 8 through 9. God may choose to display his wrath within historical events, as in Israel's wilderness wanderings, Psalm 95, verses 10 through 11, or the Babylonian exile, um, 2, 21 through 22. But his wrath will be fully expressed on the dire, the dire, the day of wrath at the end of the age, when all wrongs will be punished, Zephaniah, chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. John the Baptist warns of God's fiery judgment, Matthew chapter 3, verse 7. Jesus will execute God's wrath at his second coming, Revelation chapter 6, verses 15 to 17. While the wicked already stand under God's condemnation, John chapter 3, verse 36, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, by sinning they continue to store up wrath, Romans 2, 5, 9, 22. But God in his mercy sent Jesus to turn away his anger by a sacrifice of appropriation, Romans 3, 25, 5, 9, 1 John 2, 2, and 1 John 4, 10. Some have doubted whether a God of love can experience anger towards his creatures. The Jewish philosopher Philo championed the Stoic idea that a perfect being, by definition, could not become angry. In the 12th century, H.C. Dodd held that wrath of God is merely symbolic of the fact that sin has consequences. First law, first universal law, rule. Uh, consequences. But such viewpoints reveal more about the writer's theological assumptions than the consistent teaching of the Bible. Human anger, the Bible usually portrays human anger as sinful, because it is. Cain's ire would have been turned to good if he had repented and offered an acceptable sacrifice, but by nursing his wrath against a holy God and the righteous Abel, he ended up committing murder. And that's Genesis chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath, so warn Psalm uh, chapter 37, verse 8. In contrast with our modern emphasis on the constructive use of anger, Proverbs urges us to think carefully about expressing anger. Okay, Proverbs chapter 12, 16, 13, 29, 19, 11, and to be patient. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 32, and to show restraint, 29, 11. Angry people cause conflicts, 29, 22, 30, 33 and continually get themselves into trouble, 1919. They should be avoided, 22 through ch chapter 22, verses 24 to 25. In biblical history, Saul stands out as an embodiment of sinful rage. See 1 Samuel 19, 
and to 10, 20, through 20 chapters, 20 verse 33, 34. Sorry about the screw ups there. On the other hand, Job and his many psalmists displayed anger and frustration with their situation and at times even with God himself. At the end, Job is rebuked because he had doubted God's justice, chapter 35 through 36. But the psalmist's prayers are acceptable apparently because they are viewed, viewing the world from God's perspective since God knows the heart. It is better for them to voice their anger than it is to deny it. Jesus warns that angry people will face God's wrath. Matthew 5.22, Galatians 5.20, Colossians 3.6-8. James reflects the wisdom of the Old Testament when he tells his readers to be quick to listen, so to speak, and so to become angry. James 1.9, according to Ephesians 4.27, 4, chapters 4, 4, chapter, yeah, verse 25-27. People should speak truthfully, but their anger should be restrained, short-lived, and used for righteous ends. Provoking another person to ang anger without reason is in itself a sin. Ephesians chapter 6, 4. Anger can divide a church, 2 Colossians 12, 20, and frustrate prayer, 1 Timothy 2, 8. An elder must, be, must not be quick-tempered, Titus 1, 7. People may, however, react to sin in the way that God does in holiness and without desire for personal vengeance. Romans chapter 12, verses 19 through 21. Moses was therefore justly angry with Pharaoh, Exodus 11, 8. But Jesus, the God man gives us, is the best example of how to express righteous anger, Matthew 23, 1 through 36, Mark 3, 5, 11 through through 15 to 17, John chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. At the same time, people may believe that their anger is warranted when it is not. Such anger is usually rooted in the desire to justify oneself. Simon and Levi's slaughter of the Sheshemites goes well beyond righteous anger. Genesis chapter 34, 1 through 31, and then 49, verses 5 through 7. Jonah believed that he was right to be angry when God spared the wicked. Chapter 4. Those who angrily oppose Jesus think that God is on their side. Matthew chapter 21, verse 15 through 16. So, like the insurrectionists on January 6, for example. Even the disciples are self righteously angry with James and John. Matthew chapter 20, verse 24. And with the woman who anointed Jesus with costly ointment. Mark uh, chapter 14, verses 4 through 5. And link is in the description, by the way. Here's an excerpt from the theological article, Is Anger a Sin? by Meg Butcher. Human anger is usually portrayed as a sinful in Scripture, Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, and anger against God is always a sin. Anger becomes a sin when it is allowed to boil over unconstrained, resulting in hurt being multiplied and leaving destruction in its wake. Dave Jenkins wrote for Christianity.com, Proverbs 19.11 says, A person's wisdom yields patience. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. This is the opposite of the way society is wired to react. Feeds full of status updates claim the right to be offended. The justification of offense is everywhere, permeating every topic of conversation. But the Bible is clear about which offenses rightly justify an anger response. Christians are to turn away vindictive anger and avoid revenge. 2 Corinthians 12.20 For I am afraid that when I came I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want to be. I fear that there are may be discord, jealousy, fits of anger, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21 states, The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of anger, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warned you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And, and finally, Colossians 3 8 begs us to Rid yourselves of all such things as these anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. God takes the sin of anger seriously. It is lumped 
and with many other behaviors we would not question as sinful behavior. In Matthew 5.22, Jesus warns that angry people will face God's judgment, and according to Paul in Ephesians 4.25-27, people should speak truthfully, but their anger should, not, should be restrained, short-lived, and used for righteous ends. The link is in the description, by the way. Here's an excerpt from SpreadingJesus.org concerning the biblical definition of anger. Sudden outbursts of temper are one fruit of sinful human nature. The Bible therefore repeatedly pictures the evils of such behavior and warns God's people to avoid it. Uncontrolled anger can have far-reaching consequences, producing violence and even murder. Matthew 5, 21-22, Luke 4, 28-29, Acts 7, 54, 57 through 58, 21 through 27 through 36. It is important that a person in a position of responsibility in the church not be quick tempered. Titus 1 7. Yet there are, may be many cases where it is right to be angry. Those who are faithful to God should be angry at all forms of sin, whether that sin be rebellion against God or wrongdoing against other people. But because human nature is affected by sin, people find it difficult to be angry and at the same time not go beyond the limits that God allows. Psalms 4.4, uh, chapter 106, uh, verses 32-33, Ephesians 4.26. Certainly it is wrong for people to be so angry that they t take personal revenge. God's people must be forgiving and leave God to deal with those who do them wrong? Leviticus 19, 18, Romans 12, verses 19 to 21. If in resisting wrongdoing they are guilty of bad temper, they should not try to excuse their behavior by claiming they are carrying out God's righteous purposes, like so many Christian nationalists, for example, which of course again fail every time they test in Christ, and are heretical, outside of again not being Christians officially or otherwise because of what they do and believe. God's anger is always pure, always just, always righteous. Exodus chapter 34, 6 through 7, Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, and the link is in the description, by the way. Anger, again, is clearly defined theologically this time, and yes, it is a sin, for it leads to numerous evils very rapidly, as we've seen with extremism, international terrorism, especially our domestic terrorism. So as Christians and good people, how do we handle our own anger? Here's an excerpt from Biblical Strategies for Dealing with Anger by Josh Weedman. There can be several elements that cause a person to be angry, but they usually stem from one of the following. Love of self. When we nurture or coddle all desires for, over the desires of God, we will fall into idolatry of self and grow angry when we do not get what we believe we deserve or when we strive to keep what we think is ours. Lack of trust in God. God is fully providential and sovereign, able to care for us and leads us. However, when we struggle fully to trust him, anger can smolder in our hearts, resulting in us selfishly trying to control situations. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, verse 8 and 15. Lack of facing problems biblically. Sometimes our anger and bitterness can grow because we are not seeing our issues from a biblical mindset. When we do not find resolution to the suffering, pain, or strife we face in this life, our hearts will grow frustrated and embittered. As we deal with anger, we must cultivate a longing for God's values over the temporary pleasures of the world, 1 James uh, chapter 2, verse 15 and 17. We need to ask ourselves why we are angry, not just identify the cause of what made us angry. Identifying the motivation behind our anger can help us better address the issues biblically. We must pray and ask for God to help us to have the love of Christ in the midst of our situation. We must rely upon the word of God to speak the truth about his character and sovereignty. We must put away anger and place it with kindness, tenderheartedness, and forgiveness. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 31 through 32. The Bible tells us not to find vengeance on our own and repay evil towards those who we perceive to have harmed us. 
The greatest antidote for overcoming anger is greater trust in God. We see that Jesus Christ modeled trust in the Father in the midst of unjust circumstances. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 23. We must also allow God to be the final judge of all. Romans 12, 19. When we accept the will of God as better than our own desires, anger will begin to fade in our hearts. We must act for the good of others and the glory of God rather than strive to get our own way. True, surrender control to God will give us the greatest and most lasting results. And the link is in the description, by the way. So how do we overcome anger, wrath, and evil, for that matter? Here is an excerpt from How to Overcome Evil Leadership with Good by Mark Cook, which of course applies to overcoming confronting evil in general as a Christian. First, we must recognize our own capacity for evil. In Matthew 15, Jesus explains to his disciples that out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Matthew 15, 19, Jeremiah 17, 9, as that the heart is deceitful above all things. The disposition and habit of repentance is one we need to cultivate daily as followers of Christ. Second, we must counter evil with good. Romans 12, 21 commands us, do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we seek to follow Christ by serving others, we are overcoming evil with good. As choose to love and forgive and seek reconciliation, we are overcoming evil with good. Even the most seemingly insignificant act of kindness and love is an act of courage. Third, we must take the hard steps of confronting the evil we see around us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of our great Christian heroes, reminds us that we cannot retreat into the lives of private virtuousness. Instead, we must find strength to confront evil by single-minded devotion to Jesus. To be simple is to be to fix one's eyes solely on the simple truth of God at a time when all concepts are being confused, distorted, and turned upside down. Fourth, we must trust in God and his work in reconciliation, even when we see so much around that it discourages us. Bonhoeffer leaves us with a word of tremendous hope as we seek to live courageously as Christian leaders. In him, Jesus, the world was reconciled with God. It is not by this overthrowing, but by its reconciliation that the world is subdued. It is not by ideas and programs or by conscious duty, responsibility, and virtue that reality can be confronted and overcome, but simply and solely by the perfect love of God. Here again, it is not by general idea of love that this is achieved, but by the really lived love of God in Jesus Christ. This love of God does not withdraw from reality into noble souls secluded from the world. It experiences and suffers the reality of the world in all its hardness. Link is in the description, by the way. Quotes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer that relate. And in the incarnation, the whole human race recovers the dignity and image of God, henceforth any attack, even on the least of men, is an attack on Christ, who took on the form of man and his own person restored the image of God in all that bears the human form. Through fellowship and communion with the incarnate Lord, we recover our true humanity, and at the same time we are delivered from that individualism, which is the consequence of sin, and retrieve our solidarity with the whole human race. By being partakers of Christ incarnate, we are partakers of the whole humanity which he bore. Now we know that we must have been taken up and born in the humanity of Jesus, and therefore that the new nature we now enjoy means we too must bear the sins and sorrows of others. The incarnate Lord makes his followers the brothers of all mankind. That's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. In the New Testament, our enemies are those who harbor hostility against us, not those against whom we cherish hostility, for Jesus refused to reckon with such a possibility. The Christian must treat his enemy as a brother and require his hostility with love. His behavior must be determined not by the way others treat him, but by the treatment he himself received from Jesus. It has only one source, and that is the will of Jesus. And that's Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost Discipleship. We shall be judged according to our works. That is why we are exhorted to do good works. The Bible surely knows nothing of those qualms about good works, by which we only try to excuse ourselves and justify our evil works. The Bible never draws the antithesis between faith and good works so sharply as to maintain that good works undermine faith. No, it is evil works rather than good works which hinder and destroy faith. Grace and active obedience are complementary. There is no faith without good works, and no good works apart from faith. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. Things are much simpler here than we like. Not that we do not know God's commandments, but that we do not do them. And then gradually, as a consequence of such disobedience, we no longer know what is right. That is our predicament. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I want to live these days with you, a year of daily devotions. 
Christ did not like an agathist, love a theory about the good, he loved real people. Christ was not interested like a philosopher in what is generally valid, but in that which serves the real concrete human beings. Christ was not concerned about whether the maxim of an action could become a principle of universal law, but whether my action now helps my neighbor to be a human being before God. God did, be God did not become an idea, a principle, a program, a new universally valid belief, or a law. God became human. That's for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Ethics. Now, concerning the fallen Christians who are QAnon, Trump supporters, Christian nationalists, they all were taught the false doctrine once saved, always saved, which is cheap grace. Here is a Dietrich Bonhoeffer's take on cheap grace. Cheap grace means a grace sold on the market like cheap jack wares, the sacraments of forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. Grace is representative of the church's inexhaustible treasury, from which he showers blessings with generous hands without asking questions or fixing limits. Grace without price, grace without cost. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the cow has been paid in advance, and because it has been paid, everything can be had at for nothing. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. What would grace be if not cheap? Cheap grace is the preaching of forgiveness without requiring repentance, baptism without church discipline, communion without confession, absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. Costly grace is the treasure in the field, for the sake of man will go and sell all that he has. It is the pearl of great price to buy which the merchant will sell all his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ, for whose sake a man will pluck out the eye which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ, at which the disciple leaves his nuts and follows him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. It is the gift that must be asked for, the door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs a man his life, and it is grace because it gives a man the only true life. It is costly because it condemns sin, and grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son, ye are bought at a price. And what has cost God cannot be cheap for us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but deliver to him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of God. And that's for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. Christian love draws no distinction between one enemy and another, except that the more bitter our enemy's hatred, the greatest need of love. Be his enemy political or religious, he has nothing to expect from a follower of Jesus but unqualified love. In such love, there is no inner discord between the private person and official capacity, and both we are disciples of Christ or we are not Christians at all. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cost of Discipleship. There is no way to peace along the way of safety, for peace must be dared. It is itself the great venture and can never be safe. Peace is the opposite of security. To man guarantees is to want to protect oneself. Peace means giving oneself completely to God's commandments, wanting no security, but in faith and obedience laying the destiny of the nations at the hands of the Almighty God, not trying to direct it for selfish purposes. Battles are won not with weapons, but with God. They are won when they and all the way leads to the cross, and that's where Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The followers of Christ have been called to peace, and they must not only have the peace, but make it, and to that end they renounce all violence and tumult. In this case of Christ, nothing is to be gained by such methods, as disciples keep the peace by choosing to endure suffering themselves rather than inflict it on others, they maintain fellowship where others would break it off, they renounce hatred and wrong. In so doing, they overcome evil with good and establish the peace of God in the midst of a world of war and hate. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. We, as followers of Christ, represent Christ in our daily lives, and we cannot be of hatred, and we cannot allow our anger to control us, because Lucifer, as they've relatively proven, uses us with hatred, which death into its anger long before, in their hearts abundantly, and regardless if they desire to be used or not. This is why we must always walk in Christ, to always be of love, and to always be of peace, and be kind, caring, and compassionate, especially when we do not want to, and of course that desire to not want to, and that desire to do as we please, especially to us, is again human nature, so evil, in other words, narcissism, racism, xenophobia. If a Christian is of hatred, they are of hatred, and subsequently not of Christ or God. When it comes to 
psychology, we humans are creatures of habit, and there are subsequent patterns to our actions and words, and therefore there is no such thing as an isolated incident. We must die to our human nature, which is intrinsically evil. We as Christians are not only required to do good, but be of good, love, and to be of peace. We are to love our neighbors as ourselves, treat others as we want to be treated, as we treat ourselves, and to love our enemies, those who would wish to harm us. We are to help others, the less fortunate, those that are hurting the immigrant FRI, pray for others and forgive. Prayer is love. Prayer is intercession through Jesus to God. So when it comes to September 18th, today, knowing there could be violence or worse, we as Christians must choose peacefulness in countering evil, racism, xenophobia, Christian nationalism, domestic terrorism, where, wherever it happens and whenever it happens, regardless of the day. Holding those accountable lawfully, legally, ethically, who harm others unnecessarily is ours our first duty in regard to safeguarding life, cherishing life as good people, let alone Christians. Those that are QAnon, Trump supporters, Christian nationalists, racists, xenophobes in general, that may or may not be active today, used to be good people originally and strong Christians, but as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, things are not things are much simpler than we'd like. Not that we do not know God's commandments, but that we do not do them, and then gradually, as a consequence of such disobedience, we no longer know what is right, and that is our predicament. That is their predicament in truth. They fell by listening to fear-mongering, hate-mongering, not even counting their falls thanks to idolatry and supporting Trump and their many actions, including the events of January 6th, and no longer exemplify the fruits of the Spirit and became wrathful, and Lucifer used them. As irrevocably proven, Lucifer uses those with hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. So knowing this, we as Christians have to look on them with compassion because of our human nature, which is in evil. We can easily falter in so many ways. Least of these is anger. So we must not only die to our human nature, but we must have empathy for others, to have compassion for others, and pray and help and repent and atone and become of good and thereby reach reconciliation in the world. In closing, in regards to what may or may not happen today, God is in control. So fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. The pandemic is still ongoing, so help those around you in need of help, your neighbors. Love your neighbors as yourself. Treat those you want to be treated. Treat others as you do treat yourself. And love your enemies, those who wish to do you harm. And give them unqualified love. Exemplify the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and have self-control. And do not allow any anger to boil it over, but release it and forgive others, especially those legally holding them accountable if they harm others, so that they can repent and atone and change their ways. To do so otherwise would be apathy to evil, as well as keep grace. So forgive others, be the best that you can be, and do the best that you can do. And do good works. And before I go, I'm going to be reading you some prayers concerning protection. More specifically, passages. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest of the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the foul snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. That's uh, from Psalm 91, verses 1 through 4. And I'm going to be closing with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Anyway, stay safe, everyone, and God bless.